nation which more than any other has fought and bled. I speak for the nation which more than any other has brought a victory over our barbarous foe. I speak for France. France declares that never again will she suffer invasion of her borders. Never again will she submit to the destruction of her countryside and the slaughter of her citizens. To this end, she will have justice and security on her own terms. Then, and only then, will France grant peace. France is great, her voice is loud, and her glorious people will accept nothing less. No one has anything more to say. La séance est levée. Mr. Jones? Uh, Mr. Jones? Yes, yes, yes. Sir. Those speeches from yesterday's conference, how soon can I have the translations? It'll be on your desk by 4.30, sir. Fine. Ned? Henry, by all that's wonderful, how long has it been, a year? Nearly two. I just got a job with the American delegation as a translator. It pays not much, but it's interesting work. So here I am helping Arabia and Prince Faisal become a free nation. Well, that's great, Ned. I tell you, colonialism is dead. There must be dozens of countries competing to become free nations. Mm, I hope so, for Arabia's sake. Oh, Mr. Lawrence, may we be so presumptuous as to ask for your autograph? Why, yes, you may. Uh, I didn't realize you'd become such a celebrity. Well, power of the press has nothing to do with me. Look, I'm dining with Gertrude Bell at the Majestic tonight. Thank you. Gertrude Bell? She's written more about the situation in Arabia than anyone. Will you join us? I'd love to. Excellent. At 7.30, then. Great. Henry, this is so good. So I took my discharge from the Belgian army. I just decided it was time I quit being a spy. Well, in your last letter, you talked of going to college. Well, my boss says there's a chance of a job in the State Department, so... You're going to be a diplomat. Maybe. Oh, Henry, beware. The snares and delusions of diplomacy are not to be embraced lightly. As Arnold will tell you. Everyone, please, do you know Arnold Toynbee? If I may say, our most distinguished historian. Arnold, this is Gertrude Bell. A great pleasure. Mr. Toynbee. And my friend, Henry Jones. Pleasure to meet you, sir. How do you do? Well, Arnold, please. You see, Arnold's the man who really knows what's going on here. I wouldn't say that. He's part of the official British delegation, unlike people like me. I've been out trying to catch sight of the German delegation. Oh, really? They're due in tonight. Nobody's seen them. Don't be trying to sneak in the back way. It's true. The feeling against them is frightening. I read the newspapers. I've seen the demonstrations as well, and my fear is that we do not have statesmen with enough courage to resist the public demands for revenge. I don't know. I've been watching our president. No, really, he's a, he's a fine man. He's a fine man obsessed with forming his absurd League of Nations. And meanwhile, he's giving way to every bloodthirsty demand. He's completely outwitted. Clemenceau, a dinosaur, baying for blood. Lloyd George, a, a politician with no vision or morality at all. There's just been a war, the worst war in history. People have fought and died. You can't just suspect that they'll turn around and forgive. You can't just wipe your enemy out. Years ago, Rome could just wipe Carthage out, but now the world has changed. Everything's connected. What has happened will happen again, for better or worse. History now moves in a spiral. These men are trying to force Germany down, but it cannot be done without terrible tragedy. Push Germany down and you'll pay a price. And one day it will once more rise to the top. 
But this lot are behaving like men with no memories. And those who forget the lessons of history are doomed to repeat it. Those who forget the lessons of history are doomed to repeat it. La séance est ouverte. His Excellency, the President of the United States. Delegates, representatives, friends. For we are all friends here. We have now been engaged for five months on a course of framing a peace, a just peace, a lasting peace. Moreover, we have also been establishing for the first time in the history of mankind an international forum, a supreme body of world affairs. I refer to the League of Nations. That bright hope I know we all share. The aim of the League is simple, yet awe-inspiring. It is nothing less than the brotherhood of man. And with goodwill and calm endeavor, we shall succeed in our noble purpose. We shall succeed where great religions where even Christianity itself has failed. Why has Jesus Christ so far not succeeded in inducing the world to follow his teachings in these matters? Friends, I will tell you, it is because he has taught the ideal without devising a practical means of attaining it. That is why I propose a practical scheme to carry out his purposes. That is why I offer you the League of Nations. No more warring or petty factions. No more being at the disposal of the colonial powers. But one Arabia, independent, united, under the rule of Prince Faisal. Now, how does that sound? It sounds great. It sounds very well. Unhappily, the French have other ideas. France was to have Syria. Britain, Iraq, and the oil fields. Well, the war is over, and now the French are insisting the agreement be honored. Now, when did the French know anything about honor? Ned, that's unworthy of you. Yes, all right, I'm sorry, but it makes my blood boil. We promised independence to Faisal. I promised. And now they tell us... Oh, come on, Ned. Don't play the innocent. You knew about it all along. So, that's the hitch, Mr. Jones. An equivocal promise to a desert chieftain versus a solemn agreement between two great imperial powers. You see, there's no such thing as the Arab nation. No Arab feels part of it. He doesn't even think of himself as an Arab. What is he? A man from Damascus, Mecca, or Baghdad. A member of a particular Bedouin tribe. A Kurd, a Sunni, a Shiite. He can be any of these things. But an Arab never. At least, not yet, I'm afraid. He will be one day. I'm determined to make it happen. All by yourself, Ned? Your view is too narrow, too personal. Too personal? What other view is there? The statesman's. The statesman's? Oh, God. This way. Now just keep quiet. The president says he needs a record. With these two, he likes everything to be written down. Mr. President. Gentlemen. Gentlemen, I have to tell you, this is not the most important problem we face. Oh, it's a waste of time discussing this. The future of Arabia is settled. France and Britain made an agreement. 
Well, I wish it were as simple as that, you see. But Britain also made a promise to Prince Faisal. I am sorry that cannot be helped. Well, it was a promise. Which we knew nothing about. And let me remind you, Prime Minister, that you will get Iraq and the oil fields. And let me remind you, sir, that France's contribution to the victory in Arabia was negligible. Negligible? Gentlemen, this is a pointless argument. I believe there is a matter of principle involved here. England and France have made a secret agreement. It is my passionate conviction that secret agreements belong to the past. Mr. President, you have both accepted my 14 points. We must have open agreements, openly arrived at. You've pledged yourself to these things. Very well. The answer to this problem, therefore, is simple. We go and consult the people themselves. The people? Exactly. The people of Arabia. We ask them what it is they want. Ask them? Yes. Yes, I see. And uh, what form would this exercise in democracy take? I am proposing a commission. It will be their job to go and thoroughly investigate the wishes of the people of Arabia and to come back and report. I understand, yes. Well, it's a brilliant solution. Don't you agree? Then what do we say to Faisal tomorrow? Say? Well, we say nothing. We just listen. Or at least we listen for now. He said that. Wilson said that. I don't care about your secret agreements. That's what he said. Wonderful. Do you think he meant it? Of course he meant it. I was there, as close to him as I am to you now. Thank you. And the others, I mean, Lloyd George, Clemenceau. They just took it. They had no choice. But what will happen about Faisal? I'll listen to everything he says. Henry, you're priceless. What a boon it is to have a friend at court. <laughs> is this idea of a commission? Oh, who cares about a Tupney Hickney commission? The president does. Let him. A commission will take months, years even. The real decisions are being made now, which leaves the field clear for us and what we say. No, 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 Ned, you're wrong. You, you have to wait for the commission. That's what the president means. Wilson's an idiot. We'll run rings round him. But what if the others don't listen? They'll listen. I'll make them. But don't you see? This is the chance we've been waiting for to get out of this business with clean hands. Whose hands, Ned? Yours? Yes. Mine. And why not mine? And what are you scowling for? I'm not scowling. I just think... You think? What do you think? Some vacuous cliché of Woodrow Wilson's? Ned. Some Christmas card motto parading his wisdom? Well... Maybe that's what it sounds like, Ned, but the president means business. And I agree with him. Oh, do you indeed? I tremble. And I also think you're way out of line. Go to hell and take that sanctimonious hypocrite of a president with you. Sir, excuse me, sir. May I speak with you for a moment? It's about the conference. I'm sorry, I really need to catch up with my friend. I'm, I'm sorry. Ned! I just didn't want you to Henry, think that... don't. And don't, whatever you do, apologize. It's me who should be doing that. My behavior back there was unforgivable. I just thought you might be mad at me. Mad? Oh, I see. You mean angry. No, you didn't make me mad. It's just that I become a little cynical. And it doesn't mix too well with your idealism. <sighs> You're probably just tired. No, we're all tired. Tired and disillusioned. All except you, Henry. Now, don't change, will you? It's what makes you such a splendid chap. I just thought you might be worried about Prince Faisal's speech. Oh, I am worried. There's a lot at stake. Oh, for you, Arabia, or the future of the 20th century? Well, why, for me, of course. <laughs>
Is it your intention, sir, to speak to us directly or through an interpreter? Prince Faisal asks me to interpret for him, if it pleases this great conference. Colonel Lawrence, it pleases this conference very well. Anna at the Kalem, Bismil Fursen, Aladina Hamalu, Prayat Al Arab, Fi a Sahara, El Kubra. Prince Faisal speaks for the horsemen who carried the Arab flag across the great desert. In a nail and a salu marufen. We do not ask for favors, merely for justice and the fulfillment of your promises. We fought for the unity of our nation and the right to rule ourselves. We remind you, we speak one language. We are one race. Our lands must not be divided and given as war booty to this or that colonial power. We did not overthrow the Turk to be enslaved again. Prince Faisal says, my people were civilized when every other country here was populated by barbarians. You should remember this. Remember, too, what you promised when you needed us. Liberty and independence in exchange for our help in the great battle. We believed you. We trusted you. We joined our cause with yours. We fought and died. We have kept our own part in this bargain. We have kept our word. All we ask now is that you prove the greatness of your nations and keep yours. In return, we offer you gratitude and lasting peace. Thus speaks Prince Faisal. These are his words. Sir, do you have a moment? May I speak with you, please? I saw you the other evening at the restaurant. The restaurant? Right, right. You were the waiter. The waiter, yes. Sir, I'm sorry. I realize you must be very busy. But if I could just have two minutes of your time. Well, I really need... It is important. Please. I am working in Paris as a pastry chef. Sometimes as a waiter as well. My name is Wen I Quoc, sir. I am Vietnamese. Toi da den, na qua ong, na qua ong, dat la ter. Not very well, I'm afraid. Sir, we need your help. We? A small group of my countrymen and me. We are a delegation of patriots. We have written a petition. Is this it? For weeks now, we've tried to present it. No one will hear us. No one will even receive it. That is why I come to you. Sorry, Mr. Wynn, I... I know you can do this. I heard you in the restaurant. You are close to President Wilson. I know that you are a very important man. I, I'm just a translator. I just happen to be president. We have tried everywhere. No one will listen. All the doors shut in our faces. All we ask for is assistance. Please. Well, I can't promise you anything. Are you crazy? But, sir, all Crying the out loud. Vietnam's on the other side of the world. But so is Japan. The Japanese were our allies. They fought on our side. No, I'm sorry. Schedule is crazy enough as it is. 
It won't take long, sir. Do you have any idea just how busy we are? Yes, sir, I do. And what are the French going to say? Hell, Vietnam belongs to them. But, sir, the president says the, the whole president. world... president. <sighs> Henry, listen to me. You've done well here as a translator. I've already marked you down for a job. When this is all over, there's a post in the State Department I have in mind for you. But if you come aboard, there's one thing you have to learn. Presidents come and go. Diplomats stay. Now, I'm not criticizing Woodrow Wilson. All I'm saying is, he won't be around much longer. We will. Think about it. Something else on your mind? Yeah. Yes, sir. Didn't you hear me just now? Yes, sir, I heard. And also heard what you said about presidents, about how they come and go. And it reminded me of an old man I met in Mexico once who said pretty much the same thing. Oh, he did? He was a peasant. Most likely he's dead now. I don't even know his name. But I'll never forget what he told me. It's maybe the reason I'm here now. He said the men in power change, but the people go on suffering. Look, Jones. Sir, I really think the Vietnamese ought to be heard. Maybe people think their country's not important, and it's not our business what happens there, but it is important. These are people just like any other people. Who are we to say they can't be heard? Sir, the whole world has come to this city. Why shouldn't they have the opportunity to make their case? And we as Americans should be right behind them. Half an hour is all they need. Is that too much to ask? All right, when you get in there, keep it simple. Concentrate on the American. He'll listen, so speak mainly to him. We understand. Thank you, sir. Chok Long, my man. Come in. On behalf of the people of Vietnam, we do not ask for independence or freedom from French colonial rule, only the implementation of these points. A general amnesty for all political prisoners, equal rights for the Vietnamese and the French, freedom of the press, freedom to meet and assemble, freedom to emigrate and travel abroad, better schools, abolition of rule by the French president's decree, and the appointment of Vietnamese members to the French parliament. Sir, that is all. Thank you. Your petition will be considered. Any questions? Monsieur Bertin. I'm sorry. No. At least they heard us. I don't think they listen to anyone anymore. Someday they will listen to Ho Chi Minh. Ho Chi Minh? That's what we call him. It means father of our country. It's not a title I deserve. Thank you, Mr. Jones. You did your best. But they didn't even listen. The Frenchman went to sleep. It's what I've been telling you. The real decisions are being made in private. The colonial powers are simply carving up the world. But the Vietnamese don't even want to rule their own country. All they're asking for is to be represented in the French government for basic equal rights. Henry, Wilson aside, nobody here is interested in people's rights. It's just, it's just not fair. It's not about fairness. It's about power and greed. Well, then why did we fight in the war? Why did so many people die? Are you saying that it was all for nothing? No, no war is for nothing. But when it's over, it turns out to be something quite different from what was believed at the start. And the result is never intended to be what it is. Arnold, Henry, have you heard? The German delegation is arriving. Well, what in the world's taking them so long? A classic piece of French diplomacy. They stopped them at the border, then they took them on a very long, slow train journey through the worst parts of the battlefields. The ruin, destruction, they made them look at all of it. That must have been grim. Not as grim as what's waiting for them now they've arrived here, in Paris.
free cabs. Can you take us to the Hotel Balzac? Oh, gentlemen, come. This war had to be fought. Above all, it had to be won. The alternative was unthinkable. Hmm. Who said that? You did. I did. In a letter you once wrote to me. Oh, yes. It's a long time ago. What did you mean? I don't know. I suppose I meant the need to preserve some sort of decency. Simple human decency in a world suddenly gone mad. Do you still believe that? Yes, of course I do. Was it sane again? I, I don't know. Gentlemen, plenty potentiaries of the German Empire. The hour has struck for the weighty settlement of our account. You have asked for peace. We are disposed to give it to you. Does anyone wish to speak? Very well. <clears throat> Gentlemen, we shall study this document. And when we have determined our position... There is nothing to determine. The position is clear. I mean when negotiations begin. Negotiations. There will be no negotiations. We have given you terms, and you will sign. Are we not even to be allowed to respond to these demands? You may make observations. You have 15 days. After that, you will sign.
such an idiot. You've almost missed the whole thing. I know, I was detained. Have a drink. It's exactly what I foresaw. Wilson's given way on nearly everything. A slice of Austria for the Italians, a wedge of China for the Japanese. He came with 14 points towards world peace. Well, he's abandoned just about every one of them. If that's true, then it's tragic. Tragic? I'd say it's fatal. The terms of German reparation are even worse than anybody possibly foresaw. The document they gave to the Germans is so fierce it will bankrupt Germany. Germany will go down in chaos, then drag Europe down with her. Mr. Jones, the war you've just fought in, which your friends died in, in 10 or 20 years, we will fight over again. The worst thing in the document is this. They're insisting on war guilt. Yes, the Germans have to say the whole fault of the war was theirs. That's madness. But of course. And I tell you frankly, if I were a German, I'd refuse to sign. <clears throat> Leaders of the Allied and Associated Powers, this treaty is nothing more than a continuation of the war. Speak up, I cannot hear. A continuation of the war by other means. The reparation payments you demand will ruin Germany. She will have no navy, no army to defend herself. Her borders are violated, colonies stripped away, coal mines given to the Poles and the French. You compel us to acknowledge responsibility for the war and demand that we hand over our heroes to be tried as criminals. President Wilson, Germany laid down her arms according to the principles of your 14 points. This treaty here breaks every one of those points. May I remind you, sir, that the German armies marched home undefeated? Where is your peace? We have been betrayed. Oh, we know the hatred which meets us here. This document proves it. But you demand of us that we say we and we alone are guilty of having caused this war. Such a confession from my mouth would be a lie. What did I tell you? The old German is still there. This war was the greatest crime against humanity that any nation calling itself civilized has ever committed. Germany not only began it, but she is responsible, solely responsible for the inhuman way it was fought. Justice is what you ask for. Justice is what you shall have. The treaty must be accepted or rejected. Answer, are you ready to sign? Yielding to overwhelming force, but without abandoning its view. Speak up, I cannot hear. This is shameful. Of the unheard of injustice of the term. Speak up. The government of Germany declares it is ready to sign. Deutschland mag unterschreiben. Ich kann nicht. Ich will nicht. Lass irgendjemand unterschreiben. Ich überlasse es dir. For a minute, I thought they were going to walk out. <laughs> they can't. They're hogtied. Well, my knees were shaking. This is history. Now make the most of it. You'll never see anything like this again.
Thank you. My pleasure. You were at the hotel the night we arrived. Yeah. Sorry about what happened back there. We were expecting it in the streets, but not here. Why do they insist on humiliating us? I guess so you'll know what they've suffered. So you won't forget. I fought at Verdun. I shall never forget. I fought at Verdun, too. You know then, but I wonder, do they? Maybe in the future. The future? We shall have no future if those old men have their way. Faites entrer les Allemands. We are here to sign a treaty of peace. Victory beastly. This is the end of it. I'm afraid this is just the beginning. Leave that. Get your stuff. We need it again. Weren't we going to send a commission? Quite right, sir. We were and we shall. But the Middle East is highly unsettled. Things are very volatile there. In our view, it's imperative that we make a firm decision now, sir. I can't answer for the consequences otherwise. You agree? Obviously. I thought that we had decided. You've got your league, Mr. President. Allow us to have this. What exactly do you have in mind? Now, our line will run here. And ours runs here. 
What are those areas? Zones of influence, sir. Let me show you. British zone, French zone. I, does anyone have a pencil? Mr. President. Thank you, young man. I see. Splendid. Well, I take it we're all agreed then. What about Prince Faisal? Oh, I dare say we'll find him something. Diplomacy? Everything they promised Faisal was a lie. Is that your idea of diplomacy? <laughs> Mr. President? It's finished. No one is satisfied. Makes me hope we've made a just peace. So what happens with Prince Faisal? Maybe they'll give him Iraq. That's Gertrude's plan. She says she'll move heaven and earth to get it for him. So what will you do? Go back to England. Vegetate. Starve, I imagine. I mean, you won't starve, unless you want to. Henry, you're right, of course. And you? A glittering career in diplomacy. Ambassador to the Court of St. James? Oh, I turned it down. I'm gonna go back home, go to school. School? University. I'm gonna study archaeology. Oh, that's fine. God, I envy you. I don't know. It's pretty scary. It's been three years since I left, so... And what three years? A lifetime. I told you, I told you. Well, I should get going. So long, then. Goodbye, Henry. Henry, don't forget me. <laughs> I won't forget you. Will you write? I will. We gave the old men victory and they threw it away. We offered them a new world and they made the old one over again. Still, it might have been worse. What? I said it might have been worse!